now. <laughs> Go ahead, David. Yeah, so hey gang, from wherever the heck you are, we uh, have a special introduction to make. I want everybody to meet Hannah. She's muted. She's sitting next to me in the office here. Um, Hannah's been helping me this summer with all kinds of cool tech stuff. She Technically, she'd be an intern. She's going to be uh, finishing her computer science degree here next year at a school in Southern California, and she's been a tremendous help. Kind of, We try to do a couple of days a week, kind of on and off all summer long, but we you know, it, it missed some weeks because of my running around and everything, but I just want you guys to, to meet her. If you see her, meet her name running around or whatever, she's awesome. So she's going to join us today and just kind of listen in. Um, the rest of you guys kind of know each other. I didn't see any new names except I think Val in South Africa might be a new name. Welcome, Val. Um, Nevin Petrov, do we know Nevin? That might be a new name. I'm embarrassed if it's not. Excuse me, and I, I apologize if I met you before. I'm not real sure, but it's awesome that you're here, wherever the heck you are. So we're going to be talking a little bit about kind of three different things today. Um, the title of this was like, how can we take advantage of BTGO as a developer? I'm not really sure that all of us can, but I think that uh, many of us can. So we want to talk a little bit about that. I want to talk a little bit about this control panel and bus touch central and a lot of this is kind of regurgitating what most of you have already heard, but you know, including you in this process, I think, is really important. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about the Xcode project and the core and why, um, you know, why it may matter in terms of making plugins and how you, it, it's all kind of tied together. So I'm going to start by saying that BT goes in the store and getting downloaded and getting used, and for the most part. The people that are using it are all of our friends, you know, everybody in the forum and people who don't even really understand what it's for and that's fine. And we're all kind of making widgets and gadgets and saying, well, this is kind of kind of cool but also kind of weird. Like, what's the point? Um, I expected that. The first major hurdle was, of course, getting it in the store. So now that it's in the store, we've already got the first update approved. And I've, you know, kind of tested Apple a little bit with, with this concept of what will they let us do? So, uh -huh. as many of you know, you know, I'm trying to do things that we're trying to do things that Apple perceives as problematic, and so I'm going to touch on that a little bit again, just to make sure we're all on the same page, because the power in this and the potential in this is really, really huge. But we have to be mindful of, you know, what it is that we're trying to accomplish, and not, you know, not not good at not still not just Apple's rules; it's their philosophy and the way that they look at this. And so we all have to understand that on a phone, I've got a simulator running here. On a phone, every one of these apps on your phone, whether Apple made it or anybody else made it, as far as Apple's concerned, those are gadgets. Those are widgets. That's what those are. And in the early days of iPhone, it, if, if you knew Mac OS X before iPhone and you remember the little widget panel, I think it was called, was it not Grand Central? What's the widget panel called? Anybody remember? There's a widget panel on your Mac where you had these little weather widgets and flight widgets and all these little tools. And they were kind of cool and useful and also kind of basic and lame, but just depend on, you know, your perspective. But, yes, yeah, probably dashboard, good, good call there, Smug. But the point is, is when iPhone came out, all of these widgets that were on your computer kind of magically showed up on your phone. And they were kind of the same thing. So Apple, in Apple's mind, every app started out as a widget. And so when you have a guy like me or a company like us or a community like us saying, hey, we want to help people make widgets, right, right away there's a conflict. <laughs> so, because in, in their mind, the app store is full of a million widgets. And you go to the app store and you pay a dollar and you download it and it's compiled and there's all this, this kind of uh, formality around how you get apps on your phone. And so... You, know, you can't just throw an app in the store that says make widgets, share them with your friends, because in their mind, those are apps. Right? So we have to balance this. And so a bunch of years have gone by. The market's matured a little bit. They seem a little bit more receptive to some of these ideas. And what do you know? Lo and behold, we got BTGO approved with these basic little widgets that you can use. And so the usefulness of those today is very, very dependent on who understands them, who, who can make use of somebody you know, helping me do things. And, and we get that. Longer term, which we hope is shorter term actually, but longer term, I want you guys to imagine lots of different kinds of widgets um, that we make and that potentially you make 
that people can take advantage of inside BTGo from a user's perspective, kind of a non-developer's perspective, or, or from a developer's perspective, or maybe a client's perspective. Mm -hmm. so, the, so where we stand on that now is we got the first update approved. I stuck in some more widgets that nobody sees. We now have another update that's submitted. And I use the word snuck in. I don't feel like I'm tricking Apple, but I do feel like I'm trying to be sensitive to what they'll what they will and won't allow. So right now the, the third update is pending and it really is just the addition of the, t the nine or ten kind of core plugins that we started this whole thing with that I made a long time ago. Menus, maps, web views, things like this. In the control panel in BuzzTouch Central, I'm going to go there now. In the BuzzTouch Central control panel, I'm going to go to my BT Central dashboard. I'm going to go to my widgets. You will not see on the widget screen the word plugin. That's, that's intentional. Our concept here and our goal is we're going to try to transition people from the app to the site to then do more things with these widgets that they make. So these widgets that I'm looking at on the screen now in BuzzTouch Central are the widgets that I created in my phone. So that's an important concept. And so if somebody creates one in the phone, we want to transition them to our site and then find those same, same gadgets on the site and do more things with them. And so that's kind of, the, kind of a core idea that we all have to understand is lots of people, we hope, we hope, will start on the phone and then transition to the site. And so that's backwards from today, right? Because remember, we're trying to help people who maybe not don't even know what a compiler is, who don't know what Xcode is yet, or things like this. And so when they land on BuzzTouch.com and they find their way to BT Central, we want to show them the same widgets that they've created and then give them some additional options in the control panel to make those widgets more powerful, more flexible, things like this. And so some examples for, for all of you guys who understand how the plugins work. And the simplest examples, let's say that you're using a photo collector and you don't want, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to get the email. You want one every, every time somebody takes a picture, you want it to email your secretary. So you could come to the control panel and change the email to address, things like this. And so very, very basic ideas that serve all different kinds of interesting purposes. So the power comes in and the danger for us comes in when we start to claim, start to claim or pretend that these gadgets are apps. If we call these things apps, if we think they're apps, if we talk about them like they're apps, well then we're kind of kind of putting our nose in Apple's face. So think about going to BTGo, getting this app that we distribute, putting in a code your buddy gave you, and using his app. Right? That's problematic. <laughs> you've not you've not downloaded anything. You've not paid for anything. You've not rated it in the App Store. You've, in essence, circumvented Apple's goal here or, or concept. And so, like I said, I'm repeating myself to a certain degree because a lot of you have heard this before, but I want to I want to keep talking about that because as a developer, as a developer and as somebody who's making plugins and maybe gadgets and maybe helping clients or whatever you're doing, you need to be mindful of where, where is the opportunity to save time and save money and all that, and where is it just real risky? And so as far as we're concerned, as far as we're concerned, you're going to be able to use BuzzTouch Central to organize these widgets into menus and lists and things and, in essence, create an app along with messing with your normal standard plugins. So if I wanted to select this widget and this widget and this widget, you know, in grid view or in list view, it doesn't matter. You'll see that they're still selected. And I want to make a menu out of these. Well, then I should be able to do that. And now that menu gets a code. You share that code, and now it's got five choices. So each of these ideas moves us closer and closer to this app concept, which takes us further and further away from this loving, wonderful relationship with Apple, right? They don't, we don't want to fight with these people. So we have to balance this stuff. So that's just with simple gadgets. But think about the difference between a gadget and a plugin. So today we have this plugin market, which, by the way, if you guys want to 
kind of see what's going on in the, the structure of the site. You can see it right now. This is kind of the structure for the plugin market. The content is not here on purpose. It's all blank. I'm hiding it from you. Um, but we've got plugins and we've got our form and we've got our blog and the little chill button just like on the phone, right? We're trying to let people chill out just like they do on the phone. So that's kind of cool. Uh, but I'm using my account menu to go to the dashboard and we we're messing with our, our gadgets. So anyway, today's not the tour of the new website. That's not the point. The, the point is, is how can I understand where these gadgets fit into the overall process? So backing up a little bit, gadgets on their own have a certain amount of functionality grouped together in a menu or on a button screen have another you know potential for functionality and then you add your plugins there um, and, and, and uh, you know you can see where that creativity comes from so let's talk a little bit about why we think this is going to be so cool in Xcode now I'm jumping over to Xcode if I have my BT core app running which I do just a simple little simulator. It's the one plugin, the plugin success, you know, no big deal. No plugins in this project. We want to talk about this one singular method called refresh UI. Refresh UI. And if, if you've made a plugin before or you intend to, you're going to want to know what this refresh UI method is all about. One of the things that we want to do that actually we have had a lot of success with doing is help people on their phone kind of sort of get a little bit of a simulator experience. And so remember, not everybody knows what Xcode is or, or is going to compile or install or download or become Apple developers, all this kind of stuff. So the concept is, is if I put in a code and I make a gadget that's based on your plugin or my plugin or anybody else's plugin, and I'm running this on my phone, not in the simulator, and I'm in the control panel, and I make a change to this plugin, just like you guys are used to making now. You go to the control panel, you hit save, you update a color, you update the background image, you update some kind of property on this plugin. We want that phone to like magically change in front of their eyes without them even touching it. That's kind of the goal. And so we want them to literally just prop their phone up on their computer, have it running. It's kind of acting like a simulator now, but it's, in my opinion, made way better than a simulator because you can pick it up and play with it and actually feel how it works. You've not compiled anything, and you can get creative. So if you can imagine a blank screen, and somebody adds a piece of background art and then messes with the nav bar and maybe does some other cool stuff, I think it would be useful and powerful to have that changing in front of them on their phone. So Going back to Xcode, that will only be possible in your plugin or my plugin or anybody else's plugin if it knows how this all works. <laughs> in other words, your plugin doesn't necessarily need to be aware of the magic, the connection between the app and the control panel, but it does need to be aware of this method called refresh UI. So the first thing that somebody should write down somewhere, not me because I never write anything down, is <laughs> something along these lines. Hey, my plugin should have a method called refresh UI. And in that method, I'm going to do all my layout. So let me explain that in English. If my plugin does not have a method called refresh UI, mm -hmm. and a user's on the control panel and they change the background image, it's not nothing magic's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Nothing magic is going to happen because your plugin's not aware of this. So technically what we're doing is we're sending a message to the phone to tell them that this screen has changed. And when that occurs, and it's relatively real time, it's fast, and when that occurs, we're going to look for a method in your plugin called Refresh UI, and we're going to trigger it. So in this method, you're probably going to want to update the nav bar, update the background, update whatever it is that your plugin does that people can change. So if you had a quiz plugin, for example, you might, and they change the the width of the buttons in your control panel. Well then, your refresh UI method is going to alter the width of those buttons. And so, we don't think this is too hard to understand. Um, we, we realize that a lot of people do think this is too hard to understand. But I'm just here to tell you that if you have a method called refresh UI in your plugin, and it does all your layout, you're probably going to fire it on the view did load, like 
build the UI for the first time or alter it if it's created in a nib file right if it's ex if it's expanded from a nib file an XIB file you probably wouldn't do this all in view did load now you'll do something like refresh UI and you're just doing this in the view did load so instead of your all your layout being done in view did load you're gonna just move it to another method sometimes called a helper method called refresh UI mm -hmm. and the reason for that is is if the views already loaded and they're, the user messes with the control panel and we want to reload the layout, we're not going to leave the screen and come back. You know, we're not going to, some of you might be thinking, well, why don't you just pop the view controller off and then reload? We can do that. And we mess with a lot of that stuff. But if you, if you transition back and forth between screens, it just doesn't feel right. So what we're going to do is fade out your view, fade it back in and run our refresh UI method. And it's really fast. And that's going to be where you decide what needs to be refreshed. Hopefully that makes enough sense. So that we've experimented with a lot of different ways to try to, to try to make that easier. But what we've really decided on is just one method. If it's, the, if, it's, if, it's in the, if it's in the plugin, just trigger it. And leave it up to the plugin developer to decide. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. But if you get your plugin either in the, either in the Buzz Touch core or in the... Um, you know, if we open up BT Go or whatever and start asking people to make plugins for that or widgets for that, it's going to be dependent on that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stop there. That was 20 minutes of talk that to a developer should be pretty simple. All I did was add a method to my plugin called Refresh UI. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to open that up to a couple questions because I think that there's some, there must be some amount of confusion. So Sue. I'm going to start with you. You can turn your mic back on. Does that make sense to you, how that, what I just tried to explain? I mean, I've jumped around a little bit. We went from control panel to Apple to, mm -hmm. to BT Go. I'm just trying to kind of get everybody on the same page. Does that make any sense? So, so, what, so let, me, let, me, let me regurgitate, see if I got it right. So what the refresh UI will make it so you don't have to actually refresh the app to see the change when you make a change. Bingo. So the only time that that would be appropriate Mm -hmm. Is when the person who built the app mm -hmm. the, or the, the, the plugin or whatever right. is playing. So the developer has logged into BT Go mm -hmm. or logged into the, the, their own app project, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. in their phone, mm -hmm. and they're, they're being creative. This is not about the end users, this is about the developer who's making the thing. Right, right. Because the end users don't ever see the control panel, right? Mm -hmm. It's the connection between the control panel and the phone. Mm -hmm. which we're now calling BT Central. Mm -hmm. Chris is saying simple in quotes. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> super crazy. It's super crazy uh -huh. how this is going down. Um, but yeah, this is all in an effort. All this is, the only reason this is necessary is so that we can make that phone kind of come alive and dance and magically transform without anybody touching it. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to interact with your phone. I shouldn't have to interact with the simulator. But the simulator makes me do that. So remember, not everybody has a simulator, and even if you do have a simulator, I want this to be better than that. Mm -hmm. We want you to click buttons in the control panel and magically have your phone update itself. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we're pulling that off. I don't see any other questions. I just see some giggling in the, in the, in the chat room or whatever. Okay, so Chris has always got super technical questions. I'm going to read it before I, before I, uh, you know. Uh, vet the thing. I'm just going to read it. Here's a question. You said it's nearly in real time. Does that mean that the app is calling home to the server every X seconds? Is there a more persistent connection to the server? That's a fantastic question. And if the latter, can we still host a BT config text file elsewhere? Okay, there's a few different questions here. I think there's three. I'll try to get them all at once. The first thing he's saying is, is the app calling home every X seconds? The answer to that is no. And there's a logical reason for that. In the world of web, we call that polling. We call that polling. So think of a client-server relationship. You've got a client, in this case, the, the phone. It could be a browser or whatever. It's a phone, and then you have a server with some information. Polling means, hey, client, every three seconds, I want you to see if there's new information, mm -hmm. which is another internet request that takes bandwidth and battery and power and all this kind of stuff. And people do it. 
in the early days of the chat rooms, that's exactly how it was working. Right? Just write a little JavaScript routine and refresh every half a second or whatever. So there's some problems with that. And the biggest problem with that is, is we don't know when to poll because we don't know when things have changed. So you end up polling all the time just in case. Mm -hmm. right? And it's just horribly, it's just, it's just a bad design. But again, in the early days, it worked pretty good. So no, we're not polling every few seconds for those reasons. It would suck your battery. It would be hard on our back end, blah, blah, blah. So instead, we have what, he, what Chris is calling, quote unquote, some kind of a persisted connection. Mm -hmm. So there's yes and no in that. No, it's not a persistent connection always, but yes, it is sometimes. So let's talk about what a persistent connection is. Basically, this is a stream, right? A persistent connection is a more of a real-time permanent kind of wire between the phone and the server, and you can keep that socket open in real time so that you can send information back and forth. That is the fastest way to do things. Um, that is how all of our messaging apps work. That is how when you're typing in iMessage or in Facebook's Messenger and you you know, to see the little three dots your friend is typing kind of, that's how that works, right? There's a persistent connection. It's not polling back and forth. It's just, it's like a telephone connection between the server and the phone. So we're doing some of that. The, the, the most, uh, the technology we're relying on most of the time is just Apple's push notification system. So it takes about a half a second for Apple to send a push in our test to, to basically anybody. So when you click save in the control panel, we're sending a push, kind of an invisible push, or what we call a headless push, to the phone, which tells the phone what changed, and then we trigger the, then we trigger the refresh UI method in your screen, if that makes any sense. So that's kind of the second question. Hmm. Polling, no. How is that persistent connection? And then he's saying, as the third question, how do we, can we host a BT config file elsewhere? Absolutely. Absolutely, and here's why. None of this that I just talked about, kind of fundamentally or technically really, has anything to do with the configuration file. It has nothing to do with the process that we're already used to. Download your app, your, or download your project, put it in Xcode, run it, everything's happy, make sure the configuration file is what you want, compile it and send it to Apple. Right? You're not changing that process. This is all about kind of design mode here. You're just, you're just running your project in your phone while you figure out what you like or you're running your project in BT Go if those plugins which we're going to get to here in a minute you're running your pro your project in BT Go because you don't want to compile it or whatever and if you want to put it in the App Store you're going to eventually have to do that anyway right we're not trying to circumvent that but if you're happy just using in BT Go you can do it that way too mm -hmm. so hopefully that answers that question um, Tristan's saying I'm having deja vu. I'm not sure why, but okay. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not sure if that's a question or not. Mm. But I'll give it another sec. I don't see any other questions. I think that's all pretty easy to understand so far. Uh, oh, Mad Rod, I missed one. All images need to be via a URL. Um, not necessarily. That's kind of an open-ended question. Your project might contain a ton of them. You might take a whole image assets folder and drag it into your project and then change those images in the control panel. Your plugin might include that. Um, or you use a URL. If it's in BT Go, certainly it's going to need to be URL based. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so that makes sense. Oh, you explained this to me when I was in town. Tristan Sand. Got it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, yeah, persistent uh -huh. connections. Okay, so let's move on a little bit and talk about kind of this this big asterisk that we have to deal with, this big asterisk. Mm -hmm. In a perfect world, everybody's plugin would be compiled in BT Go, and you could use every plugin in your control panel and make all kinds of gadgets. There's two reasons, well, two big reasons why that probably will never be the case. But there's a few more reasons why we should talk about maybe. But the two big reasons are the whole idea of BT Go is it's simple. The whole idea, that's, it's a simple, consistent experience for the people who find us through that app. That doesn't really speak to you guys or people who understand what we do who are making apps. But if I'm at a wedding taking pictures and they're getting emailed to my friend and I think that's cool, I might want to use BT Go to do something like that and I don't want a complex experience. Mm -hmm. So if I go to make a gadget in the phone, I don't want... 800 choices of weird complicated things that I don't understand. 
So that's one of the reasons why we're being very sensitive to that. Another reason is we don't think it's necessarily good. We don't think it's necessarily good to just tell anybody, hey, make a plugin, we'll drag it into BTGo. And we'll put it in the next update. Imagine how heavy that thing would get. I mean, even if we put a hundred of them in there now, you know, it'd be a really big heavy download, and lots of those plugins honestly don't even get used. And so there's gonna be some kind of a balancing act between how are we going to figure out what plugins should go in BTGo, if any, right? One great argument is none, and you've got to use BT Central to do this kind of stuff. And you've got to download your project just like we've always done. There's nothing wrong with that. But we'd like to think that we can get you guys to make some plugins that will be available in BTGo if they buy them from the market mm -hmm. so that you can make some money. That, I mean, if they don't, if they don't buy your plugin, why should you give it to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe we should publish some guidelines about, you know, the, the core concepts in terms of simplicity and design. We definitely want them to look all the same, but you might have some great ideas now that you've seen my four basic, you know, simple ones. If you haven't noticed in BTGo, they're all the same. They feel the same. The buttons are the same. The art's the same. That's very intentional. Mm -hmm. It's very intentional. It's just a collection of little tools. And when we, when we begin to put those behind menus, um, I think it'll make much more sense. It'll make much more sense for the people using them. Mm -hmm. So that's a long way to say we're not real sure where we're going to go with third-party plugins in BT Go, mm -hmm. but you don't need to worry about that when you think about the BT Central and the BT Core. When you download your project, you're still going to have that connection. Mm -hmm. You're still going to have that connection. You can still do live design stuff. You know, you're going to put it on your phone, that kind of thing. So there's there's lots to consider there. We realize that, which is why this has taken us like five years to make. I had a guy in an email the other day say, why is this taking so many months to come out? I said, what do you mean? How long is it, how long is it taking? He said, well, it's been like seven months you've been talking about this. I said, yeah, I've been working on it about five years. <laughs> so what do you want me to say? I mean, sorry, right? Everybody mm -hmm. wants it all now. I totally get it. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy who wants this done more than anybody. I mean, my whole entire existence for months and months and months has been around this uh -huh. transition. It's a, it's not easy. It's uh -huh. not easy, and I definitely want this to be behind us. Um, so if there aren't any more questions about that, let's explore the site a little bit, and then just to get you a little, hopefully smiling about what the site's going to look like, and it will give you an opportunity to, to kind of comment here if you want. Um, this site is designed to look and feel a lot like the app. So I've, the, these screens are white here, the content's gone on purpose, but basically it's just it's simplified and organized into plugins, forms, blog, right? That's just what you would expect. So the item, the navigation on the left is gonna change with the navigation on the top, just like you would expect. Simple little footer. We have a docs section now. If you go to your account menu, we've got this little pop-up thing that's available everywhere. So you've got account stuff, BT Central stuff, and then help, you know, ask a question, how to's, documentation. Hannah's been working on the docs all summer, which is great. I don't think yeah. she's going to finish them. I've got a lot of work that I have to do in terms of continuing to write them, but, but the good news is we have them. Um, so that's kind of cool. Report a bug. And we think that this simplified layout um, will help everybody. Will help everybody. And so you've seen what the home page is going to look like on some of the screenshots that I put on the site. This is kind of after you're logged in kind of view. And so I think that's kind of cool. Um, I, I don't, I don't know how well, I don't know how well this is going to be received. Just this whole concept uh, with people who don't care about making apps. Right? We all care about making apps. We're really, really trying to get people to care about BuzzTouch that don't want to make apps, that just want to use little utilities in their phone, because we think that. You know, our survival depends on a larger number of people smiling when they come to our site. And today we've got a really, really wonderful group of friends and colleagues and, and kind of super users. A lot of you guys are here right now, um, and that's cool. But, you know, we're, the sustainability of what we do is becoming more and more challenging with so many different ways to do things now. It's a completely different landscape. And we're just, um, we're just doing the best we can to, to kind of evolve with it. And we think... BT Go, as simple as it seems today, and not too very 
not in not too long, we hope that we're going to be able to transition that into something pretty darn powerful and pretty darn cool that people will understand and appreciate mm -hmm. outside of our little developer circles, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Anybody going to the, I'm totally changing the subject, but is anyone, who's going to go to the UK and go see, go see Thomas in September? Anybody in this list in the UK? Oh, Matt, Rod, you going? Who? That's kind of cool. Just use the chat room with a, with a yes, yes, oh. or no. Oh, Mad Rod's saying maybe. Um, I'm, I'm going to publicly say that I really, oh, okay. really want to go. Oh. Um, I don't have a plane ticket yet. It's 1500 bucks at minimum. Um, oh. Doing the best that I can. Uh -huh. I'm hoping I can get there. Um, but I'm not ready to say yes because I'd hate to let everybody down if I couldn't, if I couldn't afford it. <laughs> so oh. I'm trying to get over there. Um, there's another one that's... I think happening in Long Beach in a few weeks in September. I'm definitely going to drive down to that one because that's a tank of gas or whatever. Dervil saying yes, she'll be there, which is cool. Mm -hmm. um, who else on our list is UK? I don't see Kitsy today. Yeah, where's Kitsy? Who's always here? I don't know. Sil, Sil from Spain. I don't know if she's going to be in the US. Sharon's going to be in LA. Mm -hmm. Kitsy's at Legoland in San Diego, or is there a Legoland in Europe? Oh, that's right. Yeah, he's got a vacation. That's right. Windsor near London. Do do UK Legos have like a funny accent? Or are they still <laughs> are they still like square and like a brick? Or they have like a weird corner on them or something like nothing in London when I was there, nothing nothing was square. Everything had like a weird little round edge to it. Yeah. So I wonder if Legos in London are or that yeah. one. Yeah, I love London. If you can if you can get out to the UK, it's just so fun to go. It's just a, that's the funnest place you can go. They speak yeah, English totally. too. It's everything's different, but they speak English, so it's a good place. It's a good first international experience. For sure, I would call it English or whatever. Let's go. Actually, <laughs> we're the ones who can't speak English. They probably speak it like it should be spoken. Yeah, we speak American. So, any, any questions about this refresh UI? You guys are the technical people. Does that method make sense to you, or is that ju is it just like elementary and you're like, duh, of course I get it, or is it just like way over your head? I have no idea. I'm going to worry about it later. Or are you going to have some example code for us that we can kind of build on? Aside from that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Right now you just have like a, a debugger message. That's all you have in there. So all it, not a lot to copy. The problem with the example code, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll make a plug in that, that takes advantage of this. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. But the idea is all you're going to do, it, it's highly dependent on what your plugin does. You're going to modify the views. So if you've got a plugin, that, well, let's, for example, this plugin that's running right now mm -hmm. is, you know, the the success plugin and it has some properties for example the let me find it here the uh, the label for congratulations down here at the bottom Congrat that's a label mm -hmm. my refresh plugin method will probably do something like this self dot label congratulations set text the new text, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is the new text is not going to be hard coded because it's going to be from the data. Mm -hmm. So we would use the BT strings method just like we do now. Everything's the same here. Get JSON property value, self dot screen data dot JSON. Um, congrats text is probably the name of that property. Right, so when somebody changes the text in the control panel and they hit save, uh -huh. you would want to update the text in that label in the refresh UI method. So that's an example. So depending on what your plugin does, you might move buttons around, you might update whatever it is that your plugin's UI looks like. Uh -huh. And you would do that in the refresh UI method. Maybe there's a maybe there's a choice in your control panel that says, you know, how many labels do you want? Four, five, six. Well, and then somebody changes that to three. Mm -hmm. So maybe in your refresh UI, you have to remove all those labels and re-add them mm -hmm. because you're, you have a sophisticated plugin. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what they change, but everything that's in the control panel that they can adjust and play with mm -hmm. should be changed in the refresh UI, like the title bar properties. Mm -hmm. Right in the background properties. Mm -hmm. If you can't, if you don't let them change them, and it's just hard coded into the way your plugin works, 
well, then you wouldn't need to worry about it in the refresh UI because it doesn't matter. They can't uh -huh. change them in the control panel. Uh -huh. We're just trying to give them that experience when they hit save uh -huh. or they play uh -huh. online that their uh -huh. phone update uh -huh. right in front of them. That's the goal. So that's a good question, Sue, example code. but And there's a simple example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that, that, that's a very, that's a very, very good visual picture of your, your typing. Instead of the word congratulations, you want to say, you you rock, you did a great job, or whatever you want to say. You as you type it, you'll just see it appear right on right on your right on your phone. Right, exactly. Cool. Yeah. And so we aren't doing. We it would be really nice and really complicated. And I actually did some experimenting with this in the first place. It would be really nice if the only thing on the screen that changed was that label. Mm -hmm instead of everything on the screen. But there's so many variables in that that we just decided it's going to be much, much easier to kind of rebuild the whole screen. It takes like a half a second. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we're, we're fading it out and fading it in with the new stuff. And so that's kind of the idea. And so, I mean, if you hit save every time, it might become a little bit of a nuisance, but most people make their choices and then save, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Think about applying a new theme. Right, all this kind of stuff. What's it going to look like? Changing the art, that kind of thing. I'm going to comment on what Joe said here real quick. Joe is saying, I'm blown away that I understand the process. <laughs> Laugh out loud. And I'm going to say, Joe, I'm not surprised mm. at all. You've been sticking with this for a long time. And the idea that this makes sense to you now just puts a huge smile on my face, right? You, you get this in a way that you, you didn't get, say, a year ago or whatever, and that's awesome. It's, it's fantastic. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, super ninja and you know, are, are not confused by some, everybody gets confused. I get confused. Everybody does. It's not, none of us are alone in that. So cool. I'm glad you, I'm glad it makes sense to you too. Is there, is there anybody in here who's just not able to, to get their head around this? Is this just way beyond their pay grade? Nobody's speaking up because everybody's getting oh. some varies. Smug saying, I don't get confused. I get puzzled. Uh -huh. yeah, to totally. I, um, I'm a little bit concerned about. I'm a little bit concerned about the volume of push notifications we're going to be sending to the developer phones. We don't really know what that's going to be, but it could get pretty high. And I don't know. I don't know how Apple views that or not. I'm not sure. I mean, we're certainly not going to be as high as some of these other people. I mean, mm -hmm. come on, they send billions of messages a second or whatever. So that's a little bit of concern of mine. There's a little bit of a latency issue. A little bit of a latency issue in that if you've got a, a crappy internet connection on your phone, like 3G or 2G or something lame, and you hit save, you know there there could be a couple second delay there, mm -hmm. and we might have to give you some choices in the control panel to like, you know, enter enter design mode or something like this before this is before this is really cool mm -hmm. kind of deal. But on on my you know California Monterey internet, it's it's pretty darn impressive. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So 140. Um, anything else, Sue? Um, yeah. Well, one thing, I, I, one question that comes to my mind is, um, so this will be in the, you know, the BT Go app. This refresh UI, but where is the code that? Um, where there must be more code someplace else in the app, right? For refresh UI. Someplace else in the app. Let's see, Locking like. Well, not not in the plugin files, but just in the. Oh, oh yeah, the BT Core itself has changed. So when you download yeah. your when you download your Xcode project. Right, right. Exactly. When you download your Xcode project, the base parent class of all the plugins, BT View Controller. Right. This class right here, mm -hmm. BT View Controller, is a, is quote unquote aware of what you just said. Mm hmm. But that, that's a little bit of a different question, though, because those people benefit less by this because they're compiling and running it in the simulator. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. Does that, does that make sense? So it's a little bit of a big, it's kind of like big deal. I got the simulator running anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some issues there. Mm -hmm. um, Sam saying, was the issue of the disappearing found gadgets fixed that I found? No. I have no idea what happened there. I've heard it twice. You're not the only one, but only two times. And just so everyone else knows, Sam logged into BTGo on his phone, made some gadgets, um, quit the app, took I don't know what he did, logged out something, 
came back to the app and his gadgets were gone and I and I like laughed when I read his post because I didn't believe him. Hmm. But he's he's claiming it. Some other else. Somebody else is claiming it. So they're certainly gone. Um, and I have no idea why. <laughs> I have no clue. So I dug around for like an hour and a half trying to figure out what in the heck happened to him. Um, you know what I didn't do though. Well, we could we could chat and talk or whatever, but. It's, I, I know for a fact, I will tell you this, they aren't literally gone. They're on our back end. I know they exist. You know, they didn't get deleted or whatever, but I don't know why they're not showing up on your phone. Oh, so you can see those on your on, on the BuzzTouch back end, but Sam's not getting them to his phone. Do you have more Hang than on one login? Second. Okay. Chris is saying, so we will be required to set up push notifications in all our apps from now on. Not necessarily, Chris. Not necessarily. There's two ways to persist this connection. One way is um, using non-push notifications, which is faster. It's kind of the default. And the other way is using push notifications for a few different reasons. We're kind of going with both. So if you don't set up push, then your persistent connection will kind of take over, if that makes any sense. Um, it's kind of the chat protocol. So that's kind of cool. And and I, and again, Chris, if if you're a, if you're going to download the apps and use them in Xcode, this whole concept of live updating stuff, in my opinion, is kind of less magical, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of less important because you you already have all the code in front of you. You're a developer. You get it. You've got Xcode running. You've got the thing running on. So unless you wanted to put it on your phone, and then start playing, I you know I get that being cool. You know, that's kind of neat. So there's some of these little nuances, little quirks that not everybody understands. There's just so many different use cases. People who don't have compilers, people who don't have a phone, people who do know how to, who want to make an app for themselves, people who want to make just app gadgets that run in BT Go. There's all these different use cases. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of nail them all. And with you guys, you're mostly about downloading and compiling. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Do we know Edgar a Avitans? I don't think we know Edgar. A couple new names in here. Hi, Edgar, wherever you might be. You got a little line through your microphone, so. Well, that's because I muted him. Like, I can unmute him. not allowing you. Hey, go ahead. You can go ahead and say hi, Edgar, Edgar, if you like. <laughs> Maybe not. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll mute you again, Edgar. Maybe he's a mystery person. He can just say hey in the chat room or something. I'm just curious where everybody is. Yeah. Cakefoot ran all ran home. He's offline. A train's like secret stealthy, always here. Mm -hmm. Sherry's nice to see Sherry's name in there. That's kind of cool. Oh, see, uh, I think I, I think I'll turn off the recording though, since it sounds like we're just going to talk now. Yeah, we're done. I'm, I don't yeah. have anything else to tell you guys.